we're back. We're live. We're here on Global Connections on a special show here on a given Wednesday morning at the 11 o'clock block with Carlos Juarez, uh, one of our old friends and uh, the host of Global Connections, who joins us by, um, I guess, by VMix call and by VoIP uh, from uh, a place called University of Puebla, which is uh, 60. University of the Americas. U of the University of America. the Americas in Puebla. Thank you, Carlos. Correct. I have to get down there and say hi, and you have to show me around <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Um, yeah, in Mexico, indeed. near Mexico City. And it's a special show because we're going to talk about Venezuela. Welcome to your show, Carlos. Aloha, and thank you so much, Jay. Great to reconnect and, of course, offer some insights into this very complex set of issues happening south of south of the border, so to speak, in, in, in basically South America, Venezuela, a real crisis that has now flared to the forefront of, of our, uh, well, of our news. It, it, it's quite dramatic, and uh, it's, it's important for us to understand what's going on. Yeah, you know, you, you, you are the, uh, what, director of the international relations uh, part of the University of, of, of the Americas there, and um, you're also, you know, you're also in Mexico, not too far away, and furthermore, you spent a fair amount of time in, in Venezuela years ago, so you're, you're in a great spot to uh, interpret what the news, to interpret not only what's happening, but what might happen and its implications. So tell us uh, from your point of view and from the, you know, the point of view of international relations, what is going on uh, south of Mexico in Venezuela? <laughs> Well, this is a crisis that, as we know, uh, and here we're speaking in you know, early February, it has flared up in the last few weeks. It's been going on for a long time. It probably stems from about 2009, uh, 2010, actually, when the previous government, uh, Hugo Chavez, uh, had uh, run into a beginning to have a economic challenges, difficulties. Uh, a few years later, the price of oil plummets. And Venezuela, a very important country in, in, in South America, 30 million people, but a very big player in the petroleum markets, uh, of course, and so it, it has this important crop uh, product that obviously um, churns uh, the industrial economies. Uh, the United States is a major importer. About one-third of the exports of their petroleum come to the U.S. alone. Uh, Russia, China, other big players. Well, can you uh, give us an update, Carlos, from, yeah. from Hugo Chavez? Uh, he was, what, 1999 or so? And uh, from there yeah, on, what, what has happened in Venezuela since then? And so he was there for just over a decade, and about five, six years ago now, he passed away in, I think, 2003. His successor, uh, his hand-picked successor, uh, Maduro is his name, Nicolás Maduro. He's the president now, uh, and he inherited the position, you might say. Uh, a year ago in May, uh, almost a year, uh, last May of, of 2018, uh, that he held a presidential election that the international community basically condemned as fraudulent. It didn't represent uh, fair, open, uh, you know, opposition was very much suppressed. And so a, a wide condemnation of that election. Uh, well, you fast forward about eight or nine months later, and now in early January, this president, uh, uh, de facto president, of course, declares himself now uh, a new term, and it sparked a lot of pushback, uh, the international community again, but more importantly, internally, Suddenly, out of nowhere, you had a young leader of the National Assembly, one of their sort of parliamentary bodies, uh, declaring himself the legitimate interim president and saying that Maduro is no longer the president. Well, the reality is today, Venezuela has two presidents. This doesn't happen often. Uh, <laughs> but, of course, one is the legitimate, uh, I'm sorry, not legitimate, one is the de facto president who's been there the last five, six years, who controls the government, who has the army, very important, the military behind him. The other, uh, who has suddenly garnered support from a lot of international actors, uh, including many of the Latin American countries, uh, uh, Chile, Colombia, Brazil, uh, Peru, uh, et cetera, Uruguay. They've all come in favor of this new opposition leader. Interestingly, Mexico, together with Uruguay, a small South American country, and Cuba, have not. Uh, they're kind of trying to go a middle ground. Uh, but you also have Canada, the, many of the European Union countries, also supporting this self-declared uh, interim president. Uh, his name is uh, Juan uh, Guaido. It's a, not, a, not a household name that you could say, but he came out of nowhere. A month ago, nobody knew who he was. 35-year-old industrial engineer, uh, but he is now given somehow voice and, and hope to some that he may be the sort of the person who can transition out of this current regime. Uh, obviously, it's very polarized. Many see the Maduro regime uh, as a very corrupt dictatorship that has obviously lost legitimacy and credibility. Others see it is the legitimate government that has been there, 
and maybe there are some who view this as a imposed from the U.S. It's a lot more complex than that. The U.S. Donald Trump has also come out to support this opposition leader, so he is kind of following so many other uh, international actors. So there you have it. It's a standoff right now. And this leader, about two weeks ago, uh, this opposition leader has now declared himself. But uh, you know, he doesn't control the. Well, you the say declared himself. I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah, it sounds like Hugo Chavez appointed him uh, as a successor, oh. but there was no popular vote. Where the people, I mean, there's a constitution in Venezuela, and I presume that under that constitution you're supposed to elect your, you know, leaders. But apparently, what there was no election of Maduro; he was merely appointed and and de facto. On the other hand, Guaido uh, was a was a was he was a leader of the National Assembly um, and elected as such, but not as the leader of the country. But however, tell me if I'm wrong about this. However, there's a provision in the constitution that says in the event of a squabble, the leader of the assembly <laughs> becomes the leader of the country. Is it something like that? I mean, it sounds like there's something a constitution like that, yeah. that isn't working quite right. Yeah, well, again, depending on who's saying that, because this opposition leader is essentially uh, invoking a, a provision of the, of the constitution that says something to the effect that if the president is unable to carry out his duties or, or essentially has usurped his power, and that's his argument, that the election held a year ago, well, in May of, of last year, was not recognized, uh, was seen as fraudulent, and so it basically doesn't give him the ability to continue in a new term. Uh, I wonder, I wonder what successor. fraudulent means, Carlos, because we know we've had, well, yeah. in fact, yesterday at the, uh, at the State of the Union and the response um, by, uh, what was it, uh, 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 Stacey uh, Abrams, um, you know, involved voter suppression, and we've had plenty of evidence in this country about voter suppression. And I'm wondering if the election last year in Venezuela involved fraud and voter suppression along those lines. Uh, I would say substantially more than the, just the, the you know the, the uh, purging of, of roles, et cetera, and the voter suppression that you've referred to, uh, which is common in, in particularly some of the southern states. In the case of Venezuela, it was basically making illegal the ability to even run for office. So some of the opposition candidates were uh, imprisoned or, or simply denied the ability to run. Um, and then using a variety of tactics. And, and the thing about Venezuela, it, it represents an interesting model of a sort of a, a form of democratic, well, we would, might, we would call it an illiberal democracy. So it uses democratic institutions to sort of squeeze out the opposition, the voices it doesn't like to hear, to control every aspect of the political system, but in ways that are, you know, deeply political, not not fair and open. The courts, for example, are not independent and free. They are stacked and controlled by the regime. Uh, but the election itself, again, charges of fraud, charges of ballot stuffing, uh, inability of, of candidates to, to simply have a, a fair shake, let's say. Uh, and it was widely condemned by international observers across the board. It's uh, very, it's and, very uh, interesting so, because what, what you have is a constitution that theoretically should work, but it isn't working. Uh, and you have people who twist and manipulate the language of the constitution mm -hmm. to, their own, to their own goals and people who... Who live on power uh, and for example as we discussed before the show the whole thing seems to pivot on who controls the army and right now maduro controls the army um, going so going forward uh, my question to you is uh, how is this going to play out you have you have uh, all this uh, international recognition of guaido at the same time you have maduro de facto controlling the army and you have the courts uh, who belong to him i mean belong to maduro um, it sounds to me like Guaido, unless there's intervention of some kind uh, or, you know, sanctions uh, or, you know, the imposition of pressure from outside, Maduro is going to win this game, don't you think? Well, he can hold on as long as he does have the support of the military, which he continues to have. But let me add to this. I mean, a year ago in particular, well, no, a little over the year, in 2017, we began to see a massive groundswell of social protests uh, in the streets. And again, it took, it took place here in the last month. So there is a, a widespread condemnation of the legitimacy of the existing regime, criticism of it, massive economic problems, hyperinflation, uh, soaring hunger disease, a massive emigration. Uh, we're told up to 3 million Venezuelans, uh, like 10% of the population has now left the country in the last maybe three years. Um, and so uh, uh, some of it is that on the streets, you know, there's a growing sentiment that uh, is trying to push him out. But here, the pressure is also now, as you touched on, 
coming from outside. And, and so you've got major governments, uh, regional governments, uh, and not just the U.S. You have Canada, many European unions. Uh, most of the major players of Latin America are putting the squeeze on him. And they have kicked him out of the OAS. They have uh, set up a group a year ago called the Lima Group, uh, Lima, Peru, the capital, uh, basically, of the major Latin South American plus Mexico. And they are essentially trying to put the squeeze on the country. Well, it's at a standstill right now, and what has happened, this Lima group in particular, together with the European Union, they've managed to negotiate, uh, you know, or else to, to put together some negotiations that are going to begin tomorrow, I believe, in, in Uruguay, in, uh, and they're going to have some dialogue. The hope is that they can negotiate a transition so that uh, somehow it can avoid a bloodshed or a violence. But the reality is that Maduro, the government uh, that is there, um, essentially controlling the military, has the weapons, has the you know, control over violence. The others have maybe, I don't know, a mixture of the moral authority, the international community support. Um, and the, the dynamics right now are such that Maduro is claiming that there's a likely you know, invasion from the U.S. And, uh, you know, that, that's an easy sort of whipping uh, dog to sort of, you know, scare up uh, uh, tension. Uh, what's happening as we speak even today, for example, uh, he has blocked the, a large bridge, a border with Colombia that uh, is uh, expected to receive some humanitarian aid coming from the U.S. and other countries, and, and he's trying to close that off, saying that this is representing sort of the invasion coming from, from the U.S. Uh, it's a mess. It's unpredictable. It could languish and go on like this for a little while, but at some point, the writing on the wall seems to suggest that there's going to be some breakthrough, either a negotiated settlement where they decide on a transition government, or, you know, this guy gets nudged out in some way. <clears throat> I think in the end, the cards are going to be held by the military, and to the extent that they may assess that this leader's resolve and his likelihood of survival should go dimmer, they may have to, they may end up negotiating a, a sort of a support for this opposition leader, and essentially, you know, things will quickly move. If that, if that happens, it'll happen very fast. But it could be stuck like this for a little while longer. Yeah, of course, uh, when you leave it in the hands of the military, you always have the risk of a military coup. Uh, and, and it would be a third person who steps up as the leader, wouldn't it? I mean, if the military took over, say, in a transitional kind of situation, um, <clears throat> they'd be in charge and they'd pick their own leadership, their own military leadership. Isn't that a possibility? It seems to happen all the time, no? Well, interestingly, Venezuela, does, you know, it had many dictatorships in the early part of the 20th century, but really since the 1950s forward, it was a relatively stable, democratic, alternating political parties. Uh, really until the late 80s, it suddenly began a transition of sorts at that time. Chavez comes in in the, in the late 20th century, and he kind of represents a break from this, even though it was a democratic process and system, it was very oligarchic, very elitist. And so waiting, what I want to get at here is, the military as an institution in Venezuela has not been involved in interventions and coups in the ways that we saw in the 60s and 70s in Brazil, in Peru, in, in, in Uruguay, in Chile. Um, and so my quick answer would be I don't myself see the military wanting to step in and, and be the, the solution. Instead, um, what's happened in, uh, under, under Chavez and under the Maduro regime, the military has been brought in in many ways to run the country, and so they are put in positions of controlling the oil industry, controlling other you know, government ministries and agencies. So they are in some ways more like political figures, and as we know, if anything about politicians, what do they want? They want survival. They want to stay in power. They want the benefits of the perks, the patronage that comes from that. Mm -hmm. But if uh, there are several other issues about the military. Um, many of them are deeply concerned about the integrity of the institution, and they don't want to see that go away. And a military coup has the risk of, of really you know, harming the institution itself. Yeah. Um, also, a public opinion, uh, and that's what's nudging on the streets, the social movement. It may uh, nudge the military to seek you know, the writing on the wall. Yeah. That, uh, on board with, with the future, yeah. they're going to be obviously purged. And, and many of those who who have benefited, uh, there's a large number of generals that have been appointed, larger than the military you know, size would, would, would warrant. So many of these are simply political appointees. Uh, the new, I'm sorry, not the new, but this opposition leader, Juan Guaido, has tried to reach out and offer them amnesty in hopes of, uh, that some of them will defect. Uh, there's been a few cases. Uh, the attaché in Washington, D.C. did so pretty early on, but he was a, a lower-ranking colonel. I believe a few days ago or this past week there was one general who essentially did fold down, but for the most part, uh, the core of the leadership, they tend to be loyalist to the 
they call them Chavistas, uh, supporters of the former Chavez, and basically uh, they are benefiting from the power and status they have. But again, uh, they're also rational humans. When the day comes that this other leader, Maduro, may be gone, uh, many of them are going to probably try to strike sure. a bargain, and rather, rather than be imprisoned or exiled, uh, they may simply switch uh, switch uh, their support. You have to look ahead, and uh, you have to look uh, see what the people want to do, and I think... Uh, we mm -hmm. had a show yesterday uh, on our Hispanic Hawaii series where we had a couple of Venezuela people here in the, uh, the studio to talk about, you know, the, the feelings of the people uh, in uh, mm -hmm. Caracas and in Venezuela. And uh, my sense of it from that and elsewhere is that the people on the streets really don't like Maduro at all. They're protesting against him and they're courageous enough uh, to take the risk and go out on the streets, even with even with the soldiers there. Um, and, and that represents a groundswell of support for Guaido. Uh, so it, it seems to me that um, if anyone is looking at the, the general sense of the, of, the, of the population, of the public in Venezuela, they will see that, the, uh, that if the public has its way, the public will, uh, will support Guaido. Uh, don't you think? And, and that's got to affect the thinking of the military. Absolutely. I think so. And, and that's where, again, if you look forward, whether it's two weeks or two months or two years, uh, there will be a transition and a change. Let's hope it doesn't uh, get there by way of bloodshed or, or violence. It's already pretty bad. And yeah. some people have said, oh, we can't sanction them. We can't do this. They're going to suffer. Well, the Venezuelans have been suffering quite a bit for the last you know, years, uh, particularly the last four or five years. Uh, the plummeting of oil prices has, has made it hard for the regime to to dole out its support. And uh, now, and now the inflation, a, the inflation is remarkable yeah, and it's yeah, happening no, as no. we speak. Yeah, we have not seen this uh, since Weimar Germany in the you know, 20s, and uh, even by comparison, I mean, the figures are staggering. A million percent a year, up to 10 million percent a year. I mean, you can't even fathom what that means. What it means is that the economy is essentially in a free fall, uh, and it has meant shortages of food, shortages of medicine, and that means everybody, even those who benefited from, let's say, the previous regime, uh, the Chavez uh, in particular, uh, there was a time when there was a lot of social spending and programs, uh, often very targeted, but it certainly gained a lot of popularity. And uh, even today, the regime, it's very interesting. We live in this age of, uh, you know, new social media and technologies. The amount of propaganda and the, the amount of, uh, let's say, uh, well, the whole industry of that is just astonishing how every day they're putting out uh, uh, information on Twitter, on Facebook, on uh, the other media, the radio, the TV, uh, advertising billboards, websites. The government has a pretty big industry of that, and so they are trying, you know, sort of drip, drip of propaganda. It doesn't let up, and, and it has meant that, uh, you know, people get bombarded with some information overload. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's hard to know if you're there in Venezuela getting good information, real information. And so for some, yes, this is all about the gringo, Yankee, you know, imperialist invaders. Uh, for many others, not quite. It's all about just, you know, the, the crisis of legitimacy that the leadership is having. And that's going to probably change the tide because the other thing is that Chavez, who was a very dynamic, charismatic leader, did have a considerable amount of support, especially among popular classes. Uh, he mobilized a lot of, uh, you know, voiceless uh, people in, from the past. The the leader that's been there now, his successor, Nicolas Maduro, doesn't have a great deal of charisma or chutzpah, a uh, former bus driver who, you know, kind of sort of came up through the ranks as a loyal uh, party, uh, you know, follower, but uh, he has not been able to mobilize the population in the same way. And then added to that, the economy has tanked. Uh, and, uh, and so he just yeah, yeah. I, th I think uh, we, we tend to think of uh, countries south of the border in some, you know, ancient way, some way it goes back many decades as underdeveloped, um, you know, a, a not having a lot of consumer goods, not having a decent economy, um, not having law and order for that matter. But but I think I'm coming to the conclusion myself that Venezuela has has been essentially a democracy in many ways. Uh, Venezuela has had some prosperity with the oil and otherwise. Venezuela enjoys a, a high level of public awareness and education. Venezuela is, is a, in large part a middle class uh, state. And it's different, you know, from our, from our profiling of South American countries in the past. Am I right about this? Absolutely. And, and the other is maybe even like the race and ethnicity. If you go to places like uh, Colombia, uh, Peru, um, Bolivia, these are 
literally dual societies, race and ethnic divisions that are pronounced. Venezuela is not. Uh, it, it is a more, uh, well, we would call it mestizo, but it had a heavy wave of different immigrants from Europe. But largely, uh, you know, uh, I guess I'm uh, reluctant to use the word white, but maybe more middle class. They don't have large indigenous populations. But even more than that, just as you touched on, throughout the 50s and 60s and 70s, there was a pretty uh, booming economy. And the oil helped to enrich that, a large growing middle class. So, you know, the average secretary or government worker could take a vacation to Miami and, you know, and, and have a level of development that was the envy of uh, the Andean countries of, you know, even Argentina, a relatively prosperous place, massive uh, economic uh, problems and, and chaos uh, and turbulence and political violence. Venezuela, relatively stable for uh, until about 1989. And um, I, I had mentioned to you earlier, this was the time when I began doing some research in, research in the area. I went down there in 89-90, and suddenly they, they, they began uh, a massive sort of uh, social movement at that time, protesting the two-party system, which, you know, on paper it looked pretty nice. They alternated power, looked like our two-party system in the U.S., uh, but it was very closed and elitist, and if you weren't part of those two parties, you know, you, you couldn't play ball. Yeah. Um, and that began what would culminate later, actually in 92, Chavez attempted an, a first military coup that didn't work, it got snuffed out, but he would come back later, six, seven years later, and by uh, the end of the 90s, he would suddenly launch, uh, you know, what he called the Bolivarian Revolution, uh, of a leftist, populist, you know, uh, transition, uh, and one that worked well for a while, had a lot of international support, particularly from the left, uh, and it reached out to communities that had been marginalized and neglected, that were not part of the elite, uh, let's say, domination. Mm -hmm. uh, and so while you had oil revenues, you could do that. You could dole out benefits and, and redirect social spending. But that began to erode, and moreover, uh, Chavez represented a new form of authoritarianism, using political institutions rather than the sort of military coups and government, but using democracy in ways that it was uh, what we call illiberal. We see it today in Hungary and Poland. We see it in the U.S. We see it uh, uh, in, in you know, the Philippines where they get elected, they get in office, but they pretty soon begin to chip away at the democratic institutions, yeah. <laughs> uh, controlling the media, using massive propaganda themselves. That's terrible. Uh, form of and, and, and the United States itself is at risk for that. Uh, right now yeah. in this administration. But I wanted to go to one other thing that we, we should discuss, and that is the external effect of this. <clears throat> you know, it, it's become clear that the United, in, in this administration, it's become clear the United States must care about the whole continent. It must care about Canada, and it must care about everything south of the border. It must care about Mexico. It must care about all of South America, um, because they're, they're close and they're con contiguous in their own way. Uh, to our own country. You know, we have land borders and so forth. And so <clears throat> their health, the health of these other countries, um, you know, affects our health. Um, and so, you know, I, I disagree with the Trump administration on trying to build walls. Uh, rather, we should be building influence and building connection, collaboration with every country south of the border, uh, and not only Mexico, but every country south of the border, for our own security, for our own protection. Here we have, um, you know, Russia coming into Venezuela and then creating its divisiveness, which it likes to do. Um, and uh, th to me, that's a risk to us. So my question to you, Carlos, <clears throat> is what effect does all this turmoil in Venezuela have on Mexico, have on South America in general, have on the United States, and have, you know, global geopolitical effect, uh, because you know it's not happening in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, and you touched on many aspects there. Today, this crisis is not just the U.S. and Venezuela, in fact, at all. Uh, Trump has come on to support this opposition leader, but he's not calling the shots or driving the issues, although the U.S. does have considerable influence and, and, and can. He's, in fact, negotiating with some of the other leaders. But I, I want to first say this crisis also un unveils the geopolitical dynamics where, again, you mentioned Russia. Uh, with the transition in Cuba, the Castros are now long gone, and, and the country is no longer, let's say, at the forefront of U.S.-Latin American relations. It's kind of on the periphery. Venezuela has emerged as the the main connection that Russia has in Latin America, and they are strategic partners, uh, both for oil revenues and, and investments that Russians have done themselves in Venezuela. Uh, also China. China is the other player that is a massive uh, foreign investor throughout South America, 
uh, the largest investor in uh, Peru and Bolivia, obviously, for their mineral wealth, but in, in uh, Venezuela as well, uh, looking at their oil. Uh, and what's interesting is that the relationship Venezuela has with the U.S., it exports a third of its oil, and the U.S. pays with cash. And so that's desperately needed. Uh, the regime needs money to, uh, to function. Uh, by contrast, the Russians and the Chinese that, bring, that get most of the rest of the oil, they are getting paid uh, debts uh, that, they, that the Venezuelans owe to them because of their investment in the country. So Venezuela does not get hard cash and currency from Russia or China but it has to pay them oil for uh, debts that they have. And so it's curious that while you've had this widespread international support for Guaido, the opposition leader, Russia, uh, together with China, together with Turkey, uh, together with uh, uh, just a couple of uh, other sort of other sort of bad boys, are you know, standing firm behind uh, the Maduro regime. Uh, and so it's got this curious dynamic. Now, aside from that, it's also interesting to see the role of Latin American countries, uh, big players like Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Brazil, I'm sorry, and Mexico, curiously, trying to somehow take a softer position, a more neutral one. Uh, some have been critical that it has been too soft, it hasn't really stepped up to join the others. Uh, this relatively new administration in Mexico is in some ways trying to assert maybe a non-intervention status, or some have said maybe it's trying to set up to be a mediator, but in fact, that role is now being assumed by Uruguay, and the European Union rather than Mexico. So Mexico's a little bit uh, outside of it at the moment, although you know they're trying to balance it, they're trying to redefine what their foreign policy should be, because Mexico, Venezuela, Brazil, these are the big uh, Latin American countries. The other final point I would add is Venezuela is important, I mean, uh, j not just because it's a big oil market, but there's a large community today and a growing one, given the, the uh, immigration and the diaspora that exists in, in South Florida, that exists in, in New York, New Jersey, and in a few other spots. A large number of Venezuelans in the U.S. now, we can speak of a, you know, of a, of a diaspora that, much like in the past, you know, Cuba, the Cuban-Americans were determining, in fact, so powerful that any presidential leader had to suck up to them. That's not happening in the case of Venezuelans, but my point is that the economies are linked, but so are the societies. We have a, you know, a big uh, community of Venezuelans. Even there in Hawaii, you've got some that you brought on your show yesterday. Uh, and so these people have an interest. That, you know, they want their kind of country to go back to what its real potential could be. Uh, these people that have left, I'm sure many of them would prefer to be going back home and rebuilding. Hopefully that can be done in the coming years. Right now, it's it's still not there. Uh, we're going to see how this crisis unfolds. Well, it could be changing dynamics in a matter absolutely. of days or weeks. Absolutely. Or, or it could languish. Yes. Well, Carlos, we'll have months. to reconnect on it because it's, it's you know, the, mm -hmm. the takeaway here is it's not over and it's complex no. and nobody knows exactly which way it's going to go. But I so appreciate mm -hmm. this discussion with you. It, it's been uh, great to, to have this fire hide fire hose of information from you, as always. <laughs> Thanks so much. I look forward to our next Global Connection. Carlos Juarez, Excellent. the host of Global Connection. Thank you so much. <laughs>